Welcome back to uh, What Stories Say with Seth and Seth. I'm Seth. I am also Seth, Seth Jr. <laughs> so we're glad to have you back with us. Today we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, another one of our uh, theme songs for mm -hmm. one of our one of our favorite books. This is a book that I use in therapy and in coaching a lot. I use it all the time. Yeah. The book is The Forgotten Beasts of Eld by Patricia McKillop. This was the uh, book that won the inaugural Fantasy Award. So 1974, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, literary community started to give what they called the Fantasy Award for the best fantasy novel written for that year. Yeah. And this was the book that won for that inaugural year, 1974. Deservedly. Fantastic novel. And and uh, so the story, and, and again, we're just going to throw this out again. There are going to be spoilers. If you don't want a spoiler for the story, then you need to turn this off, go read the book, and then you can come back and listen to this uh, mm -hmm. after reading the book. If you don't mind spoilers, then keep listening, or if you've already read the book, keep listening. Yep, absolutely. This, is this, this story is the story of Sybil, who is a, uh, a sorceress mm -hmm. who lives on the top of a mountain, and she her her specific sorcery power is that she has the ability to call uh, creatures or people by name. So if she knows your name, she can call you, and has basically a mind control power that yeah. she she has. So she has kind of this isolated um, place that she lives by herself with all of these really powerful magical creatures that she's called to her that are her servants right so they've been some of them were called by her grandfather and some by yeah. her father and then she has added to that collection so this is a menagerie of she's got a dragon and she's got a um uh, a giant boar who mm -hmm. can speak and she's got a big swan and she's got so she's got all these there's there's a, a, a whole uh, she's got a, a, a lion that is a, a, a particular which I don't remember the name of it but they're they're mostly <laughs> mythical creatures yeah that she has gathered from around the world and called them to her or is holding the ones that her that her grandfather and father had called who were also wizards with this same power her her father and grandfather are both dead now. Um, her mother is also dead, so she's alone in this uh, kind of almost almost kind of like a little a little castle on mm -hmm. the top of the mountain. But she's content to be alone. Uh, oh, she's she, very yeah, she's very happy. She doesn't there. like interacting with other people. She's very happy to be there alone with all of her creatures. Right. So the story really is about uh, what happens is Corin who is from one of the one of the lands down where all the people are he and he and his brothers have uh have taken a child who is the son of the king mm -hmm. and 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 the um and the queen who who, ha, who the queen is now dead yeah and these brothers have taken this baby this child to try to keep him away from the king and Corin is sent because Corin knows about Sybil. Most most people don't even know about her. She's mm -hmm. she's kind of a legend herself. And Corin knows about her, and he's sent by his brothers to take this child to her, where where they hope that she will protect him from the king. And so Corin gets there. He leaves the child with Sybil. While he's there, he impresses her mm -hmm. with his knowledge of myth mythical creatures yeah and uh also he tells her basically i will come to you if you need me call me if you need me and she's and she gets a little annoyed by that she says you know basically you have to come if i call you and he says it doesn't matter i will come because yeah. i choose to come anyways that that to her is a really shocking statement uh, like that totally changes her whole viewpoint of her of her own power yeah. She's like, I can call anybody that I want, but never has she had somebody say to her, I will come because I choose to come. Yeah. Um, and then she accepts this child uh, kind of unwillingly. She she doesn't really want to. She says she doesn't know how to love. She doesn't know anything about children. Yeah. But she accepts the child unwillingly. 
And Corin leaves and leaves the child there with her. And then she visits with kind of this witch woman who lives also on the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and together they kind of raise this child. They name him Tam and they raise the child. And then Corin comes back. Uh, years later, Tam is maybe 12 years old. I'm, I'm assuming about that. Something I can't like remember. that, yeah. He comes back and uh, to get the child, which was kind of the arrangement in the first place. But she's, of course, now loves Tam. She loves this child. She didn't want to give him up. And she mm -hmm. says, no, I'm not going to give him to you. Um, and, 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 and Corrin is attacked by the dragon this time as he's coming up. And he's seriously injured. And she's nursing him back to health. And uh, anyways, they're, they're, Corin and Sybil start to build a kind of a romantic tension between them. And um, eventually, uh, Sybil, because, because Tam wants to meet his father, she calls the king to come up. And the king comes and Tam meets the king. And Tam wants to go live with his dad, mm -hmm. uh, which to Sybil is a little bit of a, she feels a little abandoned by that. And, um, and then the king gets gets afraid he's afraid of Sybil because she was able to call him and, and basically force him to come I mean yeah I, I would be too <laughs> right yeah she, yeah ab absolutely but but anyways he end up, ends up hiring a wizard to call her and so then she's being enslaved by this wizard the same way she's been enslaving these these creatures and uh, eventually she's able to escape after some a, a few traumatic things and when she gets back, Corin is there, and he comforts her and takes care of her, and she decides that she she wants to marry him, and they get married and go off to his to his uh, to live on in his castle with his brothers mm -hmm. and their wives. Yeah. And and um, all along the way, she's obviously learning about the world you know she's been living all by herself well she lived with her mm -hmm. dad first who was not a good father he was very neglectful didn't care yeah. um, he eventually dies and she's up there by herself and so she really doesn't know anything about the world and how the world works yeah it, it's a really interesting setup for a story in that uh the scope of the world is really big like there's a, a lot of uh kind of this um really political intrigue going on with uh, with Corin and his brothers and the king and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously so much going on outside of Sybil's experience, but because we see the story from her viewpoint, we get only, we only like see the little bit of that that's relevant to her. And it uh, gradually as expands. Yeah, as she's gradually learning about it and she isn't really interested in any of the the politics and stuff like right. that anyway she would rather not be involved in it so it should the the side of size of the the scope of the story from what we can see gradually and begrudgingly expands as she becomes pulled into it by her relationship with this child and eventually with the man who brought him there Right. And, and, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story because I think what we've just told you now is what is what I think is relevant to to the song that I have chosen as mm -hmm. a theme song for Sybil. Um, and it is a theme song for Sybil, though I think there are a couple of lines in it that really that it, it almost like a conversation between Sybil and Corin. Yeah. As this romance starts to blossom and, and becomes... Um, something more more profound. So let's go. Let's go ahead and go into the song. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about it. So, she starts off with "I'm like the water when your ship rolled in." Oh wait, did I say what song we're doing? No. So, Dad, would you like to uh, <laughs> now? Now that we know the first line, and a lot of people will probably already know what song this is because it's a very popular artist. Uh, would you like to introduce the song to us? I would. So, our our song that 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 we've chosen is "Willow" by Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to the song with my daughter the other day, and as I was listening, to it, I was like. This is this is so much Sybil's song. Mm -hmm. It just it just it's exactly her experience. So so now that we know what the song is, and I've we've kind of given you an outline of the story. Yeah. Let's get into um, it. I'm like the water when your ship rolled in that night, rough on the surface, but you cut through like a knife, 
And if it was an open, shut case, I never would have known from the look on your face, lost in your current like a priceless wine, the more that you say... Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there because then mm -hmm. we go into the chorus. Yeah. Um, so... Again, this is this is you know this is this girl who's up there all by herself on the mountain, and all of a sudden this guy shows up with a baby. <laughs> yeah, and so, it's it's a very new, unfamiliar, and kind of unwanted experience to her. Mm -hmm. But she, you, you can see in the story, it actually jumps through time really, uh, like a lot. There's yes. there's a lot of uh, really large time skips that gives you a sense of progression that feels like you're living through an entire lifetime uh, which is really cool and you can see as that happens um, that even though uh, she's rough on the surface and isn't she, she's kind of rejecting this initially that, well, and, and she's rejected people in general yeah exactly for, for, for her whole life up to this point she has not been accepting of people in her life and, and when, when he's bringing her the baby in the first place, she's like, I can't love that. I don't know how to love a person. Yeah. I, love, I love powerful creatures. I don't know how to love a child. So she's got this roughness about her. But I love, I love this line. And I love also, I'm like, I'm like the water when your ship rolled in that night. So he's the yeah. ship. Corn's the ship rolling in with this baby. Yeah. And she's the water. And the ship, this, you can have this image of the ship kind of, Cutting, cutting through, through the, the water, water you yeah. see the water spreading out at, as the ship comes in and she's like i was the water as your ship rolled in and and then she's like i was rough on the surface but you cut through like a knife just like a ship would cut through that water like a mm -hmm. knife and so I, I love that imagery for this opening scene of this book or at yeah. least this oh, this opening uh relationship between like corn cutting and through her uh, her rejection uh, and into her experience that she's been rejecting all other people from up to this point. Right, and, and, and it's, it's interesting because Corrin, because he understands these mythical creatures, he hasn't, he, he gets in with her in a way that nobody else would have been mm -hmm. able to. She's been able to reject all people, but now he's talking about creatures that nobody else has ever heard of except for her. So now she's intrigued. So that's that kind of cutting through like a knife. He's he's able to get in to her yeah. in a way nobody else was able to because he has he understands her in a way no other person ever has. Even her father has never understood her in the way no. that he's showing this understanding. And then it says, and if it was an open shut case, I never would have known from the look in your face. That again, you know, the, the open shut case would be this idea, right? The I'm going to give you the baby and I'm going to leave and that's it. Mm -hmm. I opened it. I brought the baby. I shut it. I'm gone. But she says, I never would have known by the look on your face. And I think this goes back to this idea that he's, when he's talking to her, right? And he's telling her these things. And he tells her, even in the very beginning, that very first meeting, mm -hmm. he tells her that he cares about her. Yeah. And, and also the, the aspect of him saying if you call, I will come willingly, uh, that if it were an open shut case, he wouldn't say that. He would right. be leaving and leaving the baby behind and wouldn't see her again. Uh, but then it says, I never would have known from the look on your face. That look is his uh, outward expression of willingness to come and and help her right and then the next line i ne uh, uh lost in the in your current like a priceless wine and that's again this the same the same idea that she's like this is something she's never experienced before she's no. lost in this whole idea that somebody would come to her voluntarily mm -hmm. and and that somebody would care about her because even her father and grandfather never showed that kind of affection that kind of care for yeah. her, so there's there's something she likes about it, and she's also afraid of it. There's both of those things going on here. She's frightened of Corin, and his number one, his knowledge of these creatures that she didn't think anyone knew about but her, and number two, his his affection and caring for her. Mm -hmm. These are new things to her. So lost in the in in your current, like a priceless wine. So. You know, you think about a priceless wine, it's something, it's not something that people are rejecting. <laughs> you know, no. 
Um, but it's also not something that you experience often. Right, right. And then she's lost in it. And then the, the chorus, I think, is just... The chorus is really what initially made me... And I think that whole first, that whole first uh, stanza there, that whole first verse, really does speak to that first that encounter. That initial meeting. And that first meeting. But the chorus is what really, really made me think, this is Sybil's song. So mm -hmm. it says, the more that you say... And think about what we've just talked about. The more that Corin says to her, right? The more that you say the less I know. Wherever you stray, I fall. I'm begging for you to take my hand, wreck my plans. That's my man. Right? Yeah. Is that, I mean, that is, that is so much what she's saying to him. Even in the beginning of this story, when she first meets him, she's starting to see that the world is much bigger than anything she had imagined. Mm -hmm. and, and he knows all the things that she knows, but she doesn't know all the things that he knows. Yeah. The world is expanding. The more that you say, the less I know. She starts the less to she, The more she realizes how much she doesn't understand about the world. Um, and I think that, uh, the, the, in addition to that, the line in here that makes me think of the story the most is uh, just the really simple little bit that's wreck my plans. Yes. That it's like him coming into her life, leaving her with this child, uh, Totally. Even them falling in love with each other completely throws off everything that she thought about where her life would go. It completely right. changes the totally. entire trajectory of her life. Yeah, and, and I, I love this. Also, think about this. Wherever you stray, I follow. And I love that line because she's not necessarily in the beginning feeling that way. Like, I'm going to follow you. No. But her mind does. She can't get him out of her mind because he knows things that she, that she doesn't think he should know about. And he's offered to come to her. These are things that she's just, so all of a sudden, she's going to go, her mind at least, is going gonna, is gonna to go wherever he strays to. Yeah. And I also love the fact that the reason he knows about all these creatures is because he has traveled the world and seen many of these fantastic things yeah. even some things that she doesn't have that she hasn't called he's seen and knows because he's traveled so i love the word stray wherever you stray especially because his brothers are annoyed with him for traveling <laughs> and straying and going all over the place and and so wherever you stray well, i follow that he's and, never quite as committed to their political machinations right, as, right. as they are uh, i think he goes to Sybil and brings the the child not because uh, he really really wants all of this political stuff to work out but because he's the one of them who cares about the human element who cares right. that this is a child and we're taking it to be raised by a woman and not just a political piece being moved on right. some he, grand chessboard. He doesn't necessarily want Tam to be a pawn. He wants him to be a person. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I love that it says, I'm begging for you to take my hand. And I don't think at this moment she realizes this, but she is. She wants to be mm -hmm. a part of something bigger. Uh, you know, of, of a, of a, She wants to belong somewhere. And yeah. she, up to now, she, she didn't realize that. But when he's there, and then like you said, wreck my plans... That's the whole thing that he's doing. And then she says, yep. that's my man, right? Mm -hmm. This is my man. Anyways. It's a very, very powerful romantic message. Yes. Like, and I, I like that a lot. It just goes so well with what's going on in her life as he's bringing in this, this bigger world that totally wrecks her plan, which is just to keep gathering these creatures and getting bigger and better and stronger you know, creatures, and mm -hmm. now all of a sudden she's got this helpless child instead of a big, powerful creature. And it's like, what? Wait. <laughs> and I love yeah. it. Um, so our next verse, life was a willow, and it bent right to your wind. Head on the pillow, I could feel you sneaking in as if you were a mythical thing. <laughs> well, that I mean, isn't that perfect? I mean, yeah, that's like <laughs> the whole song. It really fits this book and this character. I mean, so well. there's a scene, and I like I haven't read the book quite recently enough to to remember exactly what goes on. But there's a particular scene, like midway through the book, 
that this is making me think of like specifically like, right when when he actually does come to her when he fulfills his promise and this is speaks exactly to what her experience is and i like how like as it says uh as if you were a mythical thing that she's comparing him to the things that she's been uh, desiring and yeah. gathering this whole time yeah. because she's realizing that this relationship with him is something that she actually wants. And that's right as, in, in that section where he starts to come to her again later after the, the major time skip where she's formed a relationship with the child who she's raised, who she mm -hmm. loves, and she's starting to realize that she loves uh, Corin as well. And I, and I actually, the, the scene you're talking about, I know what scene you're talking about, it's mm -hmm. right after she's been being called by the wizard mm -hmm. that the king has, that King Dreed has has uh, employed to call her because he's afraid of her. Yeah. So she's getting called. Um, not strong enough yet that she's forced to go, but she knows she's going to have to. Yeah. And so she calls Corin. But what's really amazing is as soon as she calls Corin, and he lives, he lives about three days horse ride from from where she is. Like if he rode hard on a yeah. horse, it'd take him three days to get from his castle to her to her little castle. Well, she calls him, and I I, I think it's within like a half hour of her calling him, he's there. Yeah, and he says, and she says, "How did you get here so soon?" And he said, "Well, you've been calling me for three days or whatever." And she says, "Oh no, I haven't." He says, "Yes, you have." And it's because she's been hurting and he could feel that pain and hurt that she's been experiencing from being called. Mm -hmm. And so he comes, but that's where, again, it's like, so it's, uh, life was a willow and it bent right to your wind, right? So, yeah. so her life is kind of being blown in his direction. She might, if it wasn't for this wizard calling her, she might never have really reached out to Corin, no. but she's thought about him and and so once this this really terrifying thing starts happening to her, she reaches she does reach out to him. So life was a willow and it bent right to your wind. Head on the pillow, I could feel you sneaking in, right? And that's exactly how she felt because she called him and he was there. Yeah. But it should have taken him 3 or 4 days to get there from when she from when she called him, but he was there. Exactly. As if you were a mythical thing like you were talking about one of these mythical creatures that she's been that she's been having like you were a trophy or a champion ring. Again, she holds these creatures like trophies, like you mm -hmm. know these, these championship rings, like I'm powerful because I've got all these powerful creatures under my control. And again, it's, it's that same imagery, as if you were a mis mythical thing, like you were a trophy or a champion ring. And there was one prize I'd cheat to win, right? Yeah. And, 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 and I think this is a moment where she's realizing I've been calling all these creatures, and specifically, there's one creature that she's been trying to call and hasn't been able to reach yet. And and and, but she realizes now that the one person that she would cheat to get would be him, would be Corin. Yeah. That when she's distressed, he's who she wants, not all these other creatures that that are there. She wants Corin. So I just, I love that. And then we go back into, back into that chorus. Now the chorus takes on a whole nother meaning, right? A deeper meaning. Yeah. The more that you say, the less I know, wherever you stray, I follow. Right, again, now, now, now she's physically wanting to be in his presence, right? Yeah. Up to this point, she's been thinking about him. She's been following him in her mind, but now she physically wants him there. She physically wants his presence. Mm -hmm. So the more, and again, he continues to share with her things that she's learning. So again, the more that you say, the less I know, wherever you stray, I follow. I'm begging for you. Now she really wants him to take her hand. In fact, in this, in this scene that we're talking about in the book, this is the first scene where, where he embraces her. Mm -hmm. And she, gets, she kind of folds herself up into his arms, um, wants that comfort, that physical touch from, a, from another human being who can protect her. So she says, I'm begging for you to take my hand, wreck my plans, that's my man. Mm -hmm. Right? So now it's just a deeper sense of that same that same thing. But now the chorus now takes another turn that the chorus that after the first verse didn't have. Now we get another turn. Mm -hmm. Part of the chorus. 
You know that my train could take you home anywhere else is hollow. That to me is his line to her. Yeah. Right. So yeah, she's saying, she's saying, take my hand, hold me, wreck my plans, be my man. And he says, you know that I could take you to my home. Mm -hmm. And anywhere else is hollow. Anywhere else. I don't want to be anywhere else. I want to be at my home, but I want you to be there with me. And then she says again, I'm begging for you to take my hand, wreck my plans. That's my man. And there's the moment when she all chooses to go with him. Right. And, and that happens after. So, so that happens the next time that he comes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, no, actually, it's not the next time he, because he stays. He stays there with her. That's right. That night. But she leaves and goes, she's called. So she goes to the, yeah. to this, uh, this wizard and, and, and goes through some traumatic experiences there. And Corin doesn't know that she's left. She leaves yeah. without letting him know. And, and then when he gets, he wakes up, she's gone. The next thing that he knows, she's coming back and it's days, maybe even weeks later. And, uh, and that's when she decides, yes, I want to go with you to your home. Yeah. Right. Um, and then, and then we repeat this, uh, a part of this uh, verse again. He says, life was a willow and it bent right to your wind, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that's the thing is she's gone, left him alone. Mm -hmm. But now she's, she's able to defeat this, this, this evil wizard and she's coming back. And she said, life is a willow and it bent right to your wind. Once again, she's coming back, being bent back mm -hmm. to him. They count me out time and time again. Right. This was again. I think that that definitely connects to that particular part of the story. Yeah. Where she's she's coming back from uh, from this experience. And the king and the wizard had the intention of breaking her mind and basically enslaving her and counting her out. Yeah. And so she says, they count me out time and time again. But life was a willow and it bent right to your wind so being bent back but i come back stronger than a 90s trend yeah. so here she is she's coming back but now she feels like she's coming back stronger mm -hmm. um and she is in a sense because now she's she's had an ex these experiences that have that have really pushed her but well, the, i mean uh, one of the things that i really love about this story is that um she has all of her magical creatures that she uh, that she brings in that she she values because she feels like that gives her some kind of me some kind of personal strength that she can bring all of these in, uh, and Corin has his complicated uh, political relationship that he has with his family, uh, but for both of them, what actually really empowers them in the story is each other that both of them are able to uh, have the power to get through their difficult situations because uh, they're together and are able to support each other. And that, I think, is a really, really powerful, um, empowering perspective for a romantic story. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so so she comes back, right? Mm -hmm. Like a like a '90s, stronger than a '90s trend, which I'm not sure how strong '90s trends come back. They can be they pretty can be... strong sometimes, <laughs> but they don't always stick around for very long. Right, and I think that's uh, in a way that's where the the stronger part comes here because this isn't just this change that she's made isn't just a fad. That it's right. it's going to continue to be to be a strong part of who she's becoming. Yeah, so this next these next lines, I think I think again, just carry us further into the story. Wait for the signal, and I'll meet you after dark. Right, mm -hmm. and and that's and that can be from the beginning to the end, where Corin is basically telling her, uh, or she's saying, "Wait for the signal, and I'll meet you." And he and he says, "Yeah, I'll come when you mm -hmm. call. When you give me the signal, I'm going to be there." Right, um, and show me the places where the others gave you scars. Now that can be both she and Corin. Right, because Corin uh, is 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 scarred and saddened by the death of his brother earlier. You know, before the book begins, his brother is yeah. killed in a battle, and and Corin is scarred by this. But now, now, uh, Sybil has been scarred by this experience with the wizard and the king, and so 
So that can go for both of them. Show me the places where others gave you scars. Now, and then she says, now this is an open shut case. Mm -hmm. Because now she's saying, she's finally said, I want to marry you. Yeah, the uh, the story, not not the actual, the whole story, but this part of the of her experience of her growth is complete. She's come to right. the, the conclusion. She's come to the conclusion that she does love Corin. She does want to marry him. She does want to be with him. Mm -hmm. So it is an open shut case. Guess I should have known from the look on your face. Every mm -hmm. bait and switch was a work of art. And oh I, yeah. And that just um, that is he was always there for her. Every time that he was there, he wasn't there. This bait and switch that she was. So I, in a way, I actually think for him, that's kind of his line. Every bait and switch was a work of art. That she, she be, uh, didn't let him know for sure how she felt. Well, she didn't know for sure how she felt. But he felt like everything she did was a work of art. He's loved her all along. He's watched her. He's and uh, But I think for her, too, there was, there was this, this sense of all of this experience kind of as a work of art bringing her together bringing yeah. bringing them together bringing her to him and i think this this line is just kind of that whole hey we're going to get married we love each other yeah and it's just a great a great line and then and then we get in back into the chorus and it's going to follow the chorus through the rest yeah it, it know, repeats the chorus along with a couple of the other lines from the song kind of mixed in there right so when we say the more that you say the less i know wherever you stray i follow now we're getting even to the deeper the deepest sense of that mm -hmm. in that now she's now she's actually going with him to the castle to his mm -hmm. castle right the more that you say the less i know but again she's more and more the world is being open to her she knows less she's getting to know more but so the more he says, the more or introduces her to, the more she knows. Mm -hmm. Wherever you stray, I follow. Again, she's physically now not just asking him to come to her, but she's physically going with him to his home. Yeah. I'm begging for you to take my hand, wreck my plans. That's my man. And of course, in this case, her her plans all along were to gather all these creatures on her on the mountain. Now she's saying, okay, you've wrecked those plans. Now she's going to take all of her creatures to his castle. Mm -hmm. And and her and his brothers are making plate rooms, spaces for these animals to live in in their castle. Yeah. So he's wrecked her plans, that's my man. And then again, I think it goes back to him, you know that my train could take you home anywhere else is hollow. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, "Yes, come home with me." So so we're getting this whole same thing, it's just a deeper sense. Yeah. Of of that, so that chorus plays over and over within the story of the book, and yeah, I think it's absolutely. so neat because it's like the song, even the chorus plays over and over, and just gets deeper and stronger as it goes. Yeah, I've seen some other stories that I've that I've kind of applied themes songs to that that happens where every time you get to the chorus, it feels like there's a little bit more to it, and it's always really cool. Right, and and we've only taken you with this through about two-thirds of the book. Mm -hmm. it, this is it's an interesting romantic, romantic storyline because a lot of books the, will end with the romances that, okay, we finally decided we like each other. Yeah, and they but, get together. But this like, one... Like I mentioned earlier, this story is giving you an experience of feeling like you're living an entire life. Like, it goes through a significant amount of the boy Tam's life and his experience and the way that... Uh, that Sybil and Corin and the other people around them are affected by all of that and all of the politics going on over all this time. So it's it's very much right. a, a very broad story, much more than you see in most other novels. Right. So and, and so finally, in the end, what we get is and and, and, and it go, we go through this course again. And I'm just gonna the more you say, the less I know. Wherever I wherever you stray, I follow, begging for you to take my hand, wreck my plans, right. Each time that you go through that, you can see in the book there's a deeper sense. Mm -hmm. And and we've gone through to this this deepest sense of, of her moving to his home, but that's not the deepest sense of wrecking her plans. Because mm -hmm. she's still holding on to these animals, these these beasts, right? Mm -hmm. When she comes there, and in, in fact she's gonna she's gonna use those beasts and her powers to help Corin's brothers overthrow the king. Yeah. But at some point 
at some point, and I and I'm, we can't go fully into the book because it's it's too much. But at some point, she kind of breaks, and 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 it's, and she realizes that what she's doing to these animals is wrong, mm-hmm. holding these animals, forcing them to be her slaves, mm-hmm. and she's able eventually to let go of all of them. But to do it, to do that, she also has to let go of Corin. Mm-hmm. And and so and so she lets the animals go, and and kind of um, uses the the animals use their powers to uh, stop this big war that's about to happen. Yeah. And and uh, and they lead Corin and his brothers off on some wild goose chase that eventually they come back from. But it's weeks and weeks, and she leaves. Corin's castle and goes back to her castle up on the mountain all by herself now because she doesn't have the animals with her. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so and so again, you know, she, there's she loves Corin, but she has to let go because she still up to this point has this idea: I can call you at any time, I can call anybody at any time, mm-hmm. and they have to come. So yeah. she has to let go of him. And that's the hardest thing for her to do. And now she's up on the mountain living by herself. And I think you can, um, you can, you can uh, read the next line, the next line of this course as it as it runs through, right? Uh, with an even stronger sense of begging for you to take my hand. She still wants him to take her hand. She still loves him, but now she's not going to be able to force herself or force herself on him. Mm-hmm. She, she, she's let go of him but she wants him to come and take her hand of his own free will now he has been doing that all along but she has not I mean she needs to be able to, to really see fully that he's going to do that even when she's not using her powers to call him at all or to, or to call anything else yeah she's letting go entirely and so then the very last the very last one she says hey that's my man that's my man. Yeah, that's my man. And I think that's that ache in her heart as she's up there on that mountain all by mm-hmm. herself. Um, and then it says, every bait and switch was a work of art. That's my man. Hey, that's my man. So that's the point where she's up on that mountain just just aching and, and feeling alone and doesn't, have it, doesn't even think that he's going to come back for her because mm-hmm. she feels like she's betrayed him. Right. There's no way he's going to come back for her. And then the last the last thing the song says, I'm begging for you to take my hand, wreck my plans, that's my man. And that mm-hmm. last line, that's my man, is when he comes, but he does come back to get her. And they go back together to his castle where they're going to live together without the animals, without her powers, um, she will always have the experiences and the knowledge, and he has that knowledge too. And it makes it allows them to be united in a way that you know uh, they have internal context that nobody else has. Mm-hmm. And so, I just think what a fantastic song yeah. to illustrate this character Sybil and her journey from the top of the mountain down to the people and where she's able to integrate into a society and belong somewhere mm-hmm. and and the and and how Corin is the one who really introduces her to all of that and and wrecks wrecks her plans but in a way that makes her happy mm-hmm. much happier than she would have been had she had she stayed with those plans right yeah, so that's uh, a very complete look at the story going through that song, which is really cool. So, so, so this was this was our theme song for Sybil in the Forgotten Beasts of Eld by Patricia McKillop. The mm-hmm. song Willow by Taylor Swift. And next week, Seth will be introducing us to. Uh, yeah, next week we'll be uh, going over um, the book. Uh, the picture of Dorian Gray. It's a, a, it's a classic, 
horror story. It's a fantastic book. It's a short book. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic book. One of these classic horror stories from the turn of the from the turn of the previous century. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a really really interesting perspective on uh, the way that we perceive the concept of beauty uh, that. Uh, I didn't really fully understand until I actually read the book all the way through relatively recently, and now it's one of my favorite books, so I'm very excited to get into that. And what song are we pairing that with? Oh, the uh, the song is um, Forever Young by Alphaville. Forever Young by Alphaville. So if, if you want to listen to that song and read that story before we come back next week with this, um, that, that, would be, that would be great, and if not, that's okay. We're going to Always, as always, we'll have spoilers. Um, this week we talked about Sybil. We talked about the song Willow by Taylor Swift. And uh, it has been good visiting with you, and we'll see you next week.